Okay, good day everyone. Uh, welcome to the um, webinar for today. My name is Nicholas Chu. I'm the Operations Director at the HRIA, EWPA and TSHA. And on behalf of all the associations, welcome to today's webinar. Um, what we're talking about today is JobKeeper 2.0. Uh, as you would be aware, uh, JobKeeper in its first uh, iteration um, is expiring on the 28th of uh, September. And so we're really lucky to have James Sanders from MST Lawyers to talk us through what the next phases of, of JobKeeper will look like. Um, just before we get started, a little bit of uh, housekeeping for you guys. Um, you've probably attended a lot of these already. However, we'll just talk about it quickly. We have the Q&A function available for you to pop through any questions um, uh, as they come into your mind and we'll endeavour to get to all of those questions. Um, secondly, we also have the chat function enabled. Uh, if you're having any issues with uh, the audio or video quality, please just put something in the chat line and um, uh, Sally and, and Linda who are working behind the scenes should be able to address that. And finally, I would remind you that uh, this webinar is being recorded and it is available exclusively to um, yourselves and you know, the members of the HRA, EWPA and TSHA. So uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to sort of pass this on and let your colleagues know about that, um, you'll, you'll feel free to do that as well. Anyway, without further ado, um, I'll hand over to James Sanders of MST Lawyers. James is an associate at MST and you'll most, modibly, most probably know him as uh, yeah, one of the voices behind our, our HR Net product. Um, and, and James has the, the very um, rare talent of uh, being a member of the legal fraternity who when I listen to, I sort of understand about 60% of what he's saying. So it's a rare talent indeed. And as an association, uh, we're very, very lucky to have him talking some real talk. So James, without further ado, I'll hand over to you uh, to talk us through JobKeeper 2.0. Thank you very much, Nick. And thank you everyone for having me here. Um, I'll just take to sharing my screen and we'll get started. Um, so uh, as Nick said, today I am going to talk about uh, JobKeeper 2.0 uh, and what changes are going to be made uh, as at the end of this month. Um, I thought from a practical point of view, it would be good to start off uh, getting and ensuring everyone's got a base knowledge of, of where we currently are and, uh, and where we are then able to head moving forward. Uh, so as we are aware, uh, the JobKeeper scheme came into effect uh, earlier this year with the bill being introduced to uh, the federal parliament in April uh, as a direct response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and originally it was planned to operate from uh, 30 March to the 27th of September. Uh, with a hope or expectation by the government that of course we would be through uh, what has turned into a slightly larger pandemic than I think anyone could have ever ever thought. Um, back in uh, the commencement of JobKeeper uh, 1.0 as I've called it, uh, to be an eligible employer you of course had to suffer uh, for most businesses a 30% reduction uh, compared to a corresponding period or uh, of the prior year uh, or an expected reduction of 30% uh, in your turnover moving forward. Uh, importantly, uh, for JobKeeper 1.0, employers only had to uh, qualify for the scheme once, and that was if you hit a reduction of 30% at any point during the JobKeeper period, uh, you would be entitled to JobKeeper moving forward, uh, including the payments to employees and the directions and uh, requests that you could make of employees irrespective of whether throughout that period uh, you then became what would we consider now a non-eligible employer and that is you were no longer suffering a 30 percent reduction uh, of course employees also had to be eligible uh, they had to be full-time part-time or long-term systematic and regular casuals uh, and they had to be at least 16 uh, although some further limitations came on to 16 and 17 year old employees uh, as the government got their head around uh, what was for those employees a significant pay increase uh, and noting that we should only be offering it to those who truly needed it uh, rather than those who were living at home and, uh, and had no expenses. Um, of course, uh, on the 3rd of August, uh, we had a eligibility date change from 1 March uh, to 1 July, which did of course uh, allow a further group of employees who had been employed uh, between 1 March and 1 July or turned 18 
uh, or uh, had become 12 months of casual with their employer, uh, access to JobKeeper, again, assisting employers to keep those employees employed uh, and provide some financial assistance to employers. Um, as I said, uh, during that period, employers were entitled to a $1,500 payment per fortnight uh, for each employee. Uh, that had to be passed on in full to all employees uh, and the employees had to be paid either the greater of that $1,500 per fortnight payment or their usual wages for work undertaken during that period. Uh, and of course, superannuation was only payable on the hours that the employee actually worked. And that is, they didn't receive any super on top of um, their 1500 if they were in fact stood down or were doing no work. Under the original JobKeeper scheme, you were entitled to make a number of enabling directions uh, and direct, uh, requests to employees. Um, these directions included uh, undertaking work at a different location, uh, undertaking reduced hours of work, which included down to zero hours, uh, and undertaking modified duties either away from the workplace or at the workplace. Uh, of course, they all had to be um, enforceable. They had to have certain restrictions placed on them, re requirements such as consultation, notice, um, and none of the, the, the directions could be unreasonable in the circumstances. Uh, we've seen a significant increase in Fair Work Commission activity centred solely around JobKeeper directions to the point where the Fair Work Commission is in fact now sitting seven days a week uh, to make their way through uh, the excessive amount of, of claims being made. Um, statistics that I read the other day indicated that of those of applications made to the Commission, 40% uh, are now JobKeeper enabling direction applications, um, which is on top of uh, the steady influx of unfair dismissal uh, and uh, other claims that employees make to the Commission on a regular regular basis. So um, there has been a significant increase in a significant number of claims made by employees. Um, for the most part, uh, they did resolve prior to a hearing and often in the employer's um, uh, benefit, um, but employees still sought to make a number of applications against their employers. Um, in addition to those directions, of course, we had two requests that could be made. Uh, one that was for an employee to work on alternative days, uh, and that an employee to, was to take annual leave uh, down to two weeks of accrued annual leave. Um, neither of these requests could be unreasonably refused by employees. Um, we had one significant case uh, where uh, a part-time employee was asked to take annual leave uh, down to her two weeks of annual leave being accrued. She refused and, and Village Roadshow took her to the commission uh, and the commission authorised that. Uh, annual leave to be taken on the basis that the employee was being unreasonable in their refusal, uh, noting that they had no um, annual leave or holidays booked after the expected end date of 27 September, uh, and in fact that the Commission could not guarantee that JobKeeper was not going to proceed past that date. Uh, so the employee was required to take that annual leave uh, for a number of weeks uh, through her employment, um, and just showing again the, the Commission's um, willingness to assist employers uh, throughout this pandemic um, where employees are, are being unreasonable uh, in terms of keeping things like their annual leave available to them. So as a result of what we've seen in the past couple of months uh, and the expectation particularly here in Victoria that we are going to be uh, in what is a fairly heavy expected recession uh, and we're going to be locked down for a bit longer. The government recently introduced their new uh, economic response package, uh, which was passed on the 1st of September, uh, which effectively now provides for JobKeeper 2.0, uh, which extends and modifies the rules uh, for JobKeeper comparatively to that of JobKeeper 1.0. And there are some significant changes uh, that employers need to be aware of, particularly employers who have uh, had an increase in work coming in, uh, or in fact reached that 30% reduction at one point in time, uh, but not have, have not seen a reduction moving forward. Uh, the most obvious of these changes is that JobKeeper is now going to be extended uh, to 29 March next year, subject to a number of limitations and requirements of employers 
uh, throughout the next six month period. So the first significant change in relation to JobKeeper is going to be the eligibilities of or eligibility of employers moving forward. Uh, so from 28 September, uh, employers are only going to be uh, eligible for JobKeeper payments if they can show that uh, there is a 30% reduction in their actual GST turnover for the September quarter uh, 2020 compared to the September quarter 2019. Now, this is a change from uh, the original JobKeeper provisions, which provided that it was uh, could be a expected reduction of 30% based on expected sales, uh, bookings, um, and quotes that have gone out. Uh, now you must be able to show that for the September quarter that will finish at the end of this month, uh, and noting that there will be a period of time between the 28th of September and uh, the date that you actually can work out your GST turnover for the September quarter, um, but you will need your accountant to be able to show that you have in fact suffered a 30% reduction in GST. Um, if you cannot show that 30% reduction uh, for the September quarter, uh, you will not be eligible for JobKeeper payments, uh, but there will be some flexibility available to you, which I'll touch on shortly, uh, which should be able to assist employers in most circumstances, again, whether this storms slightly. Um, the second change is that unlike JobKeeper 1.0, where it was a get through the pearly gates once uh, and you no longer had to worry about what your turnover was or your projected turnover uh, because you were through the gates, you were able to get JobKeeper moving forward. There is now a second test date that the government has introduced being the 4th of January for 2021. Um, you again have to demonstrate uh, for the December quarter uh, compared to the December quarter 2019 that you have still suffered that 30% loss. Um, in circumstances that you do not suffer a 30% loss compared to the December quarter uh, last year, uh, at that point, your job keeper um, eligibility will cease. Uh, and as again, I say, there will be some flexibilities, which I'll touch on, which you may be able to access if you don't quite make uh, that 30% reduction. The next significant change that the government has introduced is this reduction in um, the amount that JobKeeper will be offered or amount of JobKeeper that would be paid to employees. Um, as we know, currently uh, all employees are receiving $1,500 a fortnight if they are eligible employee, irrespective of the number of hours that the employee was doing uh, or the number of the hours the employee actually ended up doing. Um, this was uh, different to the New Zealand model that was introduced that was a broken down model uh, to those employees working more than 20 hours uh, and those working less. So in these circumstances, uh, the government has decided to um, separate employees into two categories, one being the higher number of hours worked uh, and one being the lower number of hours worked. Um, and what the government has said is that from 28 September, uh, so the start of JobKeeper 2.0 uh, until 3 January, which is immediately prior to your second test date, um, employees who have been working 20 hours or more a week on average in the four weeks prior to either 1 March or 1 July uh, will receive the higher amount, which is going to reduce down to 1200. Uh, again, the same rules will apply that you must pay the employee the greater of the $1,200 amount or the amount received as a result of completing hours. Uh, and also that superannuation will only be payable on those hours actually worked compared uh, rather than just a JobKeeper payment, which if you're receiving in full for no hours worked, will not earn you any superannuation. Um, where the employee works less than 20 hours at either of those times, uh, they will only receive $750 per fortnight um, for the period of 28 September to 3 January. Uh, and then simply from 4 January to 29 March 2021, uh, the amounts will reduce again, $1,000 down to uh, $650 for the lower amount. So by way of an example, um, 
Sorry, just, just quickly, James. Sorry, yes. Nikki, I'm just going to jump in uh, quickly so a few questions coming through. Um, listen, in terms of those two dates that are mentioned, um, can you sort of give us a little bit of guidance around you know, what the employer should be doing in terms of selecting uh, between the 1st of March 2020 or the 1st of July 2020? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the government's indicated in their legislation, and I've provided an example here to, to assist, um, that it's not a case of the employer gets to choose which date uh, would be more beneficial for them or their employees. Um, we know that from a, a cash flow point of view, it may be beneficial to be paying the lesser amount, whereas in some circumstances, uh, employers who are uh, able to pay the full amount uh, in advance of the government re refunding that amount, um, they may choose the higher amount. Um, what the legislation provides is that uh, they, that is whatever ever is the greater of the two selected dates. So by way of an example, we have an employee who is uh, employed by an eligible employer. They were doing 24 hours prior to 1 March 2020. Um, and as a result of COVID, after 1 March and immediately prior to 1 July, they were only doing uh, five hours on average. Um, in this circumstances, whilst the employer was only doing five hours immediately prior to 1 July, um, the employer will be required to pay the higher amount and the employee will be entitled to the higher amount um, yeah. because prior to 1 March, the employee was working an average of more than 20 hours uh, per week. So, yeah. simply, so it's the greater of, the, of those, those two dates. Correct. We need yeah. to take the greater of the two um, to provide employees the greatest assistance possible. Yeah, great. Thanks for that. No worries. Um, so in addition to the change in, in payments that uh, employees are going to receive uh, and employers are going to receive on behalf of their employees, there have been some changes to uh, the enabling directions and requests that you can now make to your employees moving forward. Um, I do note that I mentioned that there are going to be flexibilities for employers who are not able to receive the job keeper payments. Uh, and this is the, the legacy employer that I refer to in this slide. So after 28 or from 28 September onwards, uh, employers who have suffered a loss and unfortunately uh, employers who have not suffered any loss for the September quarter are not going to receive uh, any flexibility or any um, any payments moving forward. Um, but those who have suffered a loss of some form in the September quarter are going to fall into one of two categories. Uh, those employers who uh, are JobKeeper 2.0 entitled, so qualifying employers, uh, and those who did originally qualify for JobKeeper uh, but have not suffered a 30% reduction uh, in the September quarter, but instead uh, suffered at least a 10% reduction uh, throughout the September quarter. Uh, they're going to be called legacy employers. And that is you have suffered some form of loss of at least 10%, but you don't quite hit the 30% uh, that the JobKeeper payments require you to do so. Um, the important notes for legacy employers are that uh, before you can consider making any JobKeeper enabling directions under uh, the legacy system, you need to obtain a 10% decline in turnover certificate. Now the government has given us a template certificate. Uh, you can of course uh, produce your own or, or in circumstances that you must have a professional pr advisor produce one, they can produce their own. Um, it is important that uh, you have this certificate before you make any direction, uh, simply because if you make a direction and you do not have the certificate, this, the, the direction is null and void. It, it, it's as if it never existed. Uh, so for small business employers who are less than 15, you can produce your own 10% uh, decline in turnover certificate um, by way of a statutory declaration uh, signed by uh, a, a member of or an authorised representative of the employer, be it a director uh, or an in-house accountant, if you have one, or bookkeeper, that shows that we have suffered uh, at least a 10% reduction. Um, and in circumstances that you are a large business, uh, you must obtain that certificate from uh, a qualified financial advisor, be it your accountant, uh, a registered tax agent, uh, a BAS agent. Uh, but those people must not be a director employee 
uh, or associated entity of the employer. So if you are a CPA, for example, running a small business, uh, you can't sign off for yourself. You have to get someone else to, sorry, not a small business, large business. Uh, you can't sign off for yourself. You must have a, a, an external party review your accounts and sign off that you are uh, eligible as a legacy employer. In addition to um, making sure that you have your 10% decline in turnover certificate as a legacy employer, uh, you have two test times that you must keep aware of um, moving forward in the next six months. Uh, importantly, they are uh, 28 October uh, and 28 February uh, 2021. Now, these dates are important uh, because immediately prior to each test time, uh, be those dates, you must write to all of your employees who are currently on a JobKeeper enabling direction and advise them whether that direction will continue or it will cease. Um, and in circumstances that you do not do so, there is a significant risk and we've seen uh, the court's propensity to issue fines in this, relation, in this regard for other JobKeeper uh, infringements. You can be liable for a penalty uh, both as a, an individual, so as a director of a business, uh, but also as uh, the company itself. Uh, and for the company, it's it's upwards of $66,000 um, for failing to simply advise an employee whether their JobKeeper enabling direction will continue uh, or it'll cease. Um, and please remember, it is a positive obligation on us as employers uh, to do this. It is not something that we can uh, ask, wait for employees to come and ask us if it is going to proceed. Um, we have to uh, immediately prior to those two dates, um, write to every employee who has a JobKeeper enabling direction, be it a reduction in hours uh, or a variation to the, the location or, or um, duties that they're doing, they must be advised whether that will continue. Uh, and as I said, failure to do so uh, puts the company uh, and individuals at a significant risk of a penalty being applied. Uh, so. What, what directions can we, we make as of 28 September? So let's assume for the moment that we are either a legacy employer who has a 10% decline in, in turnover certificate, uh, or we are a JobKeeper eligible employer uh, as we have suffered at least a 30% reduction. Um, we can still make a direction to employees with some limitations to reduce their hours of work for a period of time. Um, you must still comply with the requirements um, that the employee cannot be usefully employed for their normal hours or days as a result of the COVID pandemic. Um, we must ensure that that direction is safe. Um, we cannot reduce the employee's hourly pay rate or base rate of pay as a result of any reduction. Um, we must make sure the employee is not on leave during that time, otherwise it does not count uh, as, a, as an, a job keep enabling direction period. Uh, and we must not uh, refuse any employee's reasonable request to undertake alternative employment during that period if they are able to obtain it. Um, in terms of what reduction we can make to an employee's hours, um, those qualifying JobKeeper 2.0 employers, there is no limit. Uh, you can reduce your employee's hours down to nil if you need to do so, um, and the employee must be paid um, again, uh, whatever is the greater of the JobKeeper payment, uh, all those hours that they actually do do. Um, but again, there is no limit on the number of hours you can reduce if they are not able to be usefully employed. Uh, however, for legacy employers, you cannot reduce the employee's hours to less than 60% of the hours they were working pre-COVID, so as of 1 March 2020. Um, unfortunately, this isn't one March or one July, it is simply one March. Um, for example, if an employee was working 38 hours prior to one March uh, and you are a legacy employer, you can only look at reducing that employee's hours down to around 23 hours a week uh, under a JobKeeper enabling direction. Uh, you can't reduce it down to zero uh, and you can't ask an employee to work less than two hours a day, although in most circumstances that would also breach uh, the modern award that the employer is employed under if they are, or some form of registered workplace agreement, uh, as most of those agreements and awards have a limit of generally around three hours as your minimum 
uh, engagement period per day. Uh, but do check your awards or registered agreements uh, on that. They do change. Uh, but as I said, employers, legacy employers can't reduce their employees' hours to less than 60% of their 1 March 2020 hours. Sorry, James, just a question that's come through on the chat line yes. again. Um, so a question has been asked, can the employee ask for and be authorised for annual leave during JobKeeper 2.0? Uh, yes, they absolutely can. Um, there's nothing stopping them to do so. Um, this is uh, in circumstances, presumably, that the employee, employer, uh, or sorry, employee is requesting the the annual leave be taken. Um, yes, you absolutely can during 2.0. Um, I will get to JobKeeper enabling requests shortly. The change for JobKeeper enabling requests uh, has come through, uh, which means that you're not going to be able to ask them to take uh, or request them to take. Um, annual leave after 28 September, uh, but I will touch on that in a second. Yeah. Uh, in the right. meantime, I'll work my way through the, the remaining two uh, directions. Uh, you can still direct an employee to perform alternate duties, both as a legacy and an eligible employer uh, from 28 September. There's no changes there. Um, again, the, the conditions set out on the slide must be met, and that is the employees must be able to undertake the duties. They must be safe and the employee must have a license if necessary, um, and the duties must be within the scope of the employer's business. Um, for example, I had one, um, but in circumstances that you are a, for example, a party hire business, you can't ask the employer to come around and mow your lawns. Um, I did have a client, not a party hire business, but a client asked if they could have employees do so in circumstances that they were being paid enough for, for the employer. The answer was no, they weren't a lawn mowing business. So it wasn't something that you could actually ask your employees to do. Um, but look, the duties must be within the scope of the employer's business. Um, and of course, you can direct your employees to work at a location other than their usual workplace. Now that's not necessarily going to be uh, useful for everyone, uh, but in circumstances that uh, businesses are closed or businesses uh, close their factory but have administrative staff who um, we need to continue working and they can work from home. We can of course direct them to work from home uh, or direct them to work from another location which could of course be an alternate office. Um, so um, yes you can absolutely direct employees to work at a different location keeping in mind is it safe uh, and is there uh, no unreasonable requirement for the employee to travel a significant uh, distance to get to the new location. Um, the slide I've provided here outlines the, the important changes for employers um, after 28 September, um, which we need to keep aware of, particularly again as, as JobKeeper eligible employers moving forward. Um, under the original JobKeeper 1.0, um, the immediate or the at the end date for all JobKeeper enabling directions was automatically going to be at the end of 27 September. That's of course been extended now to 29 March. Um, one category that has been included uh, into this re these requirements or lack of enforceability, uh, which has come out as a result of uh, some of the cases we saw in the commission, uh, was that um, the, the direction will not be enforceable if it is unfair, if it has an unfair effect on employees given the direction when compared to other employees in the same category. Um, in short, what that means is if you have uh, two employees who do the same job, you can't stand one of them down entirely uh, and keep the other one entirely employed. You must spread the load or spread the, the stand down amongst all employees who share their position. Um, if there is clearly an identifiable difference between employees, uh, for example, a yard hand without a truck license compared to a truck driver who can do the yard hands role, but also uh, drive a truck. You can, of course, stand the yard hand down uh, and have the truck driver do uh, both jobs and take on the amount of work there is uh, because it would not be considered unfair given that there is a significant difference between the abilities of both employees. Um, uh, also, um, legacy employers, you are required to provide seven days notice of the intention to issue the direction, whereas uh, job eligible, job keeper eligible employers or qualifying employers, 
uh, you still only have to provide three days notice, uh, which has been the case throughout the JobKeeper 1.0 period. Okay, so uh, another question for you, James, just before you move on. Um, so in terms of so this deadline, so 27th of September 2020, yes. uh, what is it that um, employers should be doing for employees that are on the, the JobKeeper uh, in, enabling directions? You know, what are the steps they need to be taking? Yeah, absolutely. So um, what we found throughout this process was a lot of employers um, put JobKeeper enabling directions that had a cessation date uh, of 27 September in there. Um, they need to, as a starting point, be reviewing their JobKeeper enabling directions um, because if they're the JobKeeper enabling directions that they provided to their employees and noting they all had to be in writing um, have a an end date of 28 September, um, we need to be issuing new JobKeeper enabling directions now uh, to ensure that we can extend past 27 September uh, and into um, again, for legacy employers, the test date, uh, or for JobKeeper enabling uh, employers, the date that we will find out whether we have had a 30% reduction. So um, yeah. the most immediate need for, for employers with employees on JobKeeper enabling directions is to check what their written agree or written direction to their employees was, uh, and to make sure that they're not going to lapse uh, at the end of this month, despite the fact that the uh, legislation would in fact allow them to continue. And so just sort of thinking about what you're saying there, yes. th there may well be, I guess, a bit of a, a balancing exercise. So understanding, you know, where they sit in September as to if they're likely not to fall into a legacy employer or, or fully JobKeeper 2.0 enabled and what the differences that are in terms of what you can do with the enabling directions uh, and the notice periods. Yeah, that's exactly right. And in fact, one further item I've not even put in these slides, it's more an issue for, for the accountants to be aware of. Uh, and something given that the, the GST reduction is something we're going to need to speak to to our financial advisors on. Um, the legacy um, period uh, between 28 September and the end of uh, October is in fact the June quarter. So we are going to be aware of we're a legacy employer uh, or uh, not for the, for the start of October. Yeah. Uh, but importantly, um, from 28 September onwards, um, if we are going to be a job keeper and eligible employer, um, that's the one that's going to have some some confusion around it, uh, mm -hmm. as we're not required to look until the September quarter. Um, yeah. But again, things that need to be looked at with our, with our accountants. Yeah, understood. Great. Um, so the change in relation to job keeper enabling requests that we, we briefly touched on a, a moment ago, um, we can still, of course, request employees to work on different days or times. And again, the employees cannot unreasonably refuse these requests. Um, but the big change for employers is that after the 28th of September, um, we can no longer request an employee uh, to take annual leave. So during JobKeeper 1.0, uh, employers were or should have been um, asking their employees to take annual leave um, to allow us to reduce that annual leave overhead balance down to, to two weeks. Um, we now have uh, no ability after the 28th of September to ask employees to take annual leave under the JobKeeper scheme. Um, there are, of course, some um, abilities under uh, modern awards, um, but again, not a JobKeeper enabling request that we're going to be able to make uh, moving forward. Okay, just and another one that's sort of come through, maybe you can clarify it for us, um, James. Is, yes. uh, so the question is, we've been asking employees uh, with over two weeks annual leave to, to take leave during the JobKeeper period. Um, can I request an employee to take the leave uh, now for on or after 28th of September? Good question. Uh, unfortunately, the answer to that one is also no. So uh, the commission, uh, sorry, the, the government has indicated that whilst we can have requests that are made uh, up to 28 September. We in fact can't make any requests from 28 September onwards. And we actually can't make any requests now for a period after 28 September. Um, so importantly, we've still got just under 12 days of which we can use this JobKeeper enabling request. So it's not too late to, to make some use of it. Yeah. Um, we cannot make any requests uh, moving forward. I do note that most modern awards received what was called a Schedule X into the modern award. 
uh, which included uh, for non-job keeper employers an ability to um, in request employers to take annual leave. That in fact is available till the end of this month, so the 30th of September, uh, and can be for periods after 30 September. Um, so there is some, some investigations to take place there as to, to modern awards again. Um, yeah. You may be able to use that rather than job, job keeper enabling requests. Yeah, I guess at face value, um, uh, yeah, 20th of September it seems like a, a pretty hard line in the sand subject to those, the sort of testing it with those modern award, award wages. Correct. And that's exactly the government's intention was we, we've given you a reprieve period um, or a period in which we can, you can ask your employees to, to undertake these, this leave. Um, that, that door is now closing very quickly uh, yeah. at the end of this month. Um, I would recommend that anyone who wants to ask employees to take annual leave after 28 September um, through agreement, uh, give us a call uh, and we'll walk you through the steps uh, that, you can, that you can use um, and, and walk you through your modern awards or your collective or enterprise agreements um, and see what clauses you've got available to you to, to make that same request, albeit under a different, a different structure. Yeah, understood. Great. Thank you. Uh, so the next question then comes as, well, what, what do I do as an employer if I'm not JobKeeper 2.0 eligible? Uh, or I'm not going to be a legacy employer, and that is anyone who's suffered only a 9% reduction or less, uh, or is in fact, um, as a result of COVID-19, uh, to use a marketing term, pivoted our business, uh, and we're now in fact doing better than we were. Um, there are a number of steps that you can take uh, as an employer, most of them involve agreement with employees, um, which we are still seeing uh, quite a lot of at the moment. Employers are still understanding that this is a a situation that is not the normality um, and employees are willing to assist where, where possible. Um, the first one, of course, is to, to sit down uh, and explain and be very open with the employees as to, to what's going on. Um, we are either there's not as much work, although it might be more profitable, um, so we don't have as many hours for you. Um, in some circumstances, we can add to this group um, job keeper employers who don't want to have employees stood down for the period under JobKeeper, because of course you accrue annual leave on the full hours while someone is stood down. Um, we can sit down with our employees, chat to them and get their agreement to reduce their hours, uh, change their duties or change the location the works to be completed. So um, there's in circumstances that an employee signs off on, on that agreement or agrees to it uh, and we provide a confirmation in writing, uh, then you can absolutely make those changes with your employees. It's just a case of having that discussion with them, uh, being very open with them as to why we need to. Uh, and we are seeing, as I said, a significant uptake from uh, employees to those variations, uh, mostly because employees now are aware that there aren't jobs out there for them uh, and they're not going to find uh, greener grass somewhere else. Uh, and so to help keep them employed, help the business run, uh, a number of variations to agreements are being made. Uh, the second option for non-job keeper or legacy employers is to again review your your registered workplace agreements and modern awards um, a number of the older uh, collective and, and certified agreements that are still out there uh, and the early on enterprise agreements do have clauses in there that are very beneficial for employers um, and they include you know, clauses in relation to the taking or direction of taking annual leave um, as i said earlier we can still do that irrespective of job keeper if our certified or collective or enterprise agreement provides for an ability for us to direct annual leave to be taken, uh, assuming it is reasonable, uh, then we can of course make that direction through consultation with our employees. Um, and then the final step or the final option that employers may choose to take uh, is an organisational restructure uh, or classically the redundancy. Um, do we have enough work for employees that we've currently got employed? Um, are we going to need to look to let some of them go? Uh, and what do we need to do if we are looking at letting them go? Um, if we are staring down the barrel of not being a legacy employer or a job keeper employer come the end of this month, um, and this is something that you need to consider, it's something you need to consider today or at least this week. Um, redundancy is to be done correctly and keeping in mind that a redundancy is a full defence to any unfair dismissal claim if done correctly. Uh, they do need time, they do take time to, to enact correctly. Um, there are a, a number of steps that you must follow, um, steps that can't be done in a 24-hour period. Uh, in brief, 
uh, and I re strongly recommend anyone who, who's thinking of going down this path, give us a call uh, to make sure that we go through it correctly. Um, but in summary, we need to undertake an investigation uh, that is in writing, that includes correspondence between uh, managers and directors of the business to ensure that um, if we are ever called upon to evidence our need for redundancy, we've got paper trails to show that, in fact, there was a need. Um, ultimately come up with a an interim position that is, yes, we think we need to make some people redundant based on our investigation. Um, if there are multiple people that fill one role um, and we no longer need that many, so again, if we've got five truck drivers and we only need four moving forward, um, we will need to undertake a selection of those five uh, and work out which one employee we are going to make redundant um, that needs to be on fair and objective criteria. Um, often things like unexplained absences, complaints by customers, um, late for work, um, anything that is not a protected reason, um, qualifications, um, experience, quality of work, these sort of uh, criteria we can put next to each of the employees and score them out of 10 and ultimately give whoever's got the lowest score um, the opportunity to be made redundant. Um, but we must, of course, consult with them before we do. Um, we must also offer any redeployment opportunities. So if we are in the circumstance of not requiring a truck driver or one of our truck drivers, but we do need a yard person that we are currently employing for, uh, we must redeploy them into that position or at least offer them that redeployment before we fill the role. Um, and then, of course, do we have to pay them any redundancy pay? Uh, it may simply be the case for some businesses that an employee has been with us a long time, uh, they've got notice period long service leave and uh, and redundancy pay if we're a large business, uh, keep in mind large business is 15 or more, uh, you may simply not be able to afford making someone a redundant, uh, in which case uh, we may need to look at alternative options, which of course we can, we can assist you through. Uh, and the final thing I'd just quickly like to touch on today uh, is something that's only recently come out of the Commission a couple of weeks ago. Um, as I said, a number of modern awards received what was called a Schedule X, um, which was to help employers with flexibility through the JobKeeper or the, the pandemic period. Um, the Fair Work Commission and the Deputy, uh, sorry, the President of the Commission have, uh, at the end of August, released a draft flexibility schedule. Um, so one good thing that has come out of this pandemic is the Commission now understands, despite the screams of employers for years, they have now understood that the, the award system that we've got is very rigid uh, and doesn't allow particularly small businesses to um, adjust on the fly as new issues arise. Um, so they are proposing to introduce into a number of awards. Uh, importantly for us, one of those is going to be the, hopefully, the General Retail Award. Uh, they've not given us an indication of if it's going into all awards, some awards, or is going to be limited to small businesses, um, but they've prepared a draft flexibility schedule that touches on a, a number of um, abilities for employers and employees to agree on that would generally result in uh, overtime payments under the awards or um, variations that were, were not allowed under awards um, to be now to be made. Um, we've again got no deadline as to when this is going to be introduced or, or when it's going to happen. Consultations are taking place as we speak. Um, but some of the examples that are, are really going to be game changers for employers are things like varying the span of hours that an award provides for. So if your award provides for hours to be between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., um, otherwise you're paying overtime uh, and you generally need your employees to start at 7 a.m., um, there is an ability under this flexibility schedule to vary the span of hours by an hour at each end, which would of course allow you to employ staff one hour earlier than the, the standard spread without actually paying overtime rates. You would simply pay ordinary hours. Uh, and that of course works at the other end as well. Um, and also uh, there is, from the looks of it, going to be an ability for, in circumstances that employers need to reduce hours across the board. Currently we have to get agreement with each and every employee um, failing which we either need to go down redundancy process or we've got one employee who refuses to have their hours reduced whereas everyone else's hours are reduced uh, and you get a bit of disgruntlement between those employees who have agreed to reduce their hours. Uh, there is a proposal that after 75, after a vote of 75%, 
you could look to reduce all of your employees hours by a set percentage based on what the vote um, was put to employees as uh, which is a fundamental change to employment law as we as we know it because uh, currently you can't vary an employee's hours unilaterally you have to get agreement uh, but if this was to come in it would provide employers particularly small businesses where uh, there is going to be a quiet period of the year uh, or something happens in the industry that of course results in a reduction in the amount of work uh, you can go to your employees and ask them as a as a whole to reduce their hours uh, and if 75 percent agree you'll be able to reduce those hours for everyone irrespective of whether a, the, there was a 25 percent who didn't agree they would still have their hours reduced so uh, i just put this slide here to show that the commission is aware that changes need to be made to the award structure uh, and they are working through it um, it will take some time. Um, it's expected to be in for a 12 month period whenever it does come in. Um, but look, there is light on the horizon uh, for employers uh, who need some flexibility. Um, so the Commission is working on it. Um, but otherwise, that's it from me, um, unless anyone's got any questions. Yeah, thanks for that, James. And, and thank you for um, presenting that in, a, in a, a clear and sort of relatable way. Once again, you know, understood well above 60% of that, so, so well. Glad I got right. above 60%. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> um, yeah, listen, there's, there's a few questions that are, that are coming through, uh, and one of them is it, certainly one that I've heard anecdotally quite a bit, and that relates to employees that are already receiving you know, JobKeeper entitlements, um, but they're not coming into work. Yes. What, can, well, what can be done to ensure that they are coming into work? Yeah, absolutely. This, this is a problem we've seen from day one, particularly for casual employees, um, where the, the, the view is I'm receiving job keepers, so I'm simply not going to come to work. Um, the, the starting point is uh, we need to find out why they are not coming to work. Um, if they provide us with medical evidence um, or, or a valid reason, then that, that's fine. They're entitled to do so. Um, however, the employee's position is simply I'm not coming to work because I come to work, I get paid 1500 a fortnight, or in the circumstances moving forward, 1200 or 1000 a fortnight. Um, but I'm not, if I come to work for one day a week, I'm gonna get the same, um, so I'm not going to bother. Then it, it's a starting point of, we need to discipline that employee. So we write to the employee, we indicate that they've been absent for an, what we consider not to be a valid reason. Um, if they may need to provide us in writing within 24 hours, why they've not, chosen to come to work, they will then put their reasons in writing again, um, which we will then indicate is insufficient. Here's a warning, you must turn up to work tomorrow uh, or for your next shift that we direct you to attend, um, failing a valid reason or failing any alternate reason. If you don't turn up, we will fire you. Uh, and if the employee uh, refuses to attend, we still have to go through the process of, uh, unfortunately, writing to them or, or speaking to them, obtaining from them, again, their reasons why they failed to attend that shift. Um, if the reason stays the same, and that is, I just want my money and I don't want to come to work, then we can, we've got grounds to dismiss the employee. Uh, the commission has not been very, um, whilst it normally is a, an employee friendly area, it's not been very forgiving to employees uh, who want to take money but don't want to do work. Uh, we've seen that for a number of years uh, in redundancy terms, uh, and we've been seeing it where um, the employees are asking not to have to work but to receive payment. Um, the Commission has also um, indicated that it, it is reasonable to expect casual employees to continue to undertake um, the average number of hours they were doing pre-JobKeeper uh, throughout the JobKeeper scheme. So um, if we are moving forward as JobKeeper employers and we are employees who are refusing to come to work, uh, we need to just simply go through a performance, well not even a performance, but a disciplinary process yeah. and ultimately dismiss their employment if they don't pull up their socks. Yeah, and from what you're saying there, James, you know, key to that is obviously being seen to be communicating and also documenting that communication and you know, asking for those reasons and, and keeping that you know, all, all on record, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Always keep records uh, and always write to employees. That's the most important thing. Yeah, uh, okay. To employees. Fantastic. Um, so another question that we've got here is, um, so I'm an eligible employer. Mm -hmm. um, how do I make sure that my JobKeeper enabling directions are enforceable? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as I said before, fir first thing we need to do is um, check that moving forward, um, our current JobKeeper enabling directions uh, are um, 
not going to automatically cease on the 27th of September. Yeah. Um, if they are, the first step is we need to write to employees uh, and indicate that it is going to continue uh, past 28 September. We then need to look at, are we going to be a legacy employer or an eligible employer or, or nothing? Um, if the answer is, uh, we look like we are going to be nothing and by the time the, gut, the, the accountant has given us our, um, our finances for, for the quarter, um, then we need to bring that JobKeeper enabling direction to an end. Uh, if we're going to be a legacy employer, uh, we need to make sure that we comply with um, the reduction in hours limitation um, moving forward and in circumstances that we need to vary our JobKeeper enabling direction, um, we can do so as soon as we become aware of that information. Um, and if we are going to be a full job keeper eligible employee, uh, sorry, employer, uh, moving forward, uh, we will be able to access the full entitlements. Um, the one thing that I will remind is um, the October and February test dates for legacy employers. Um, you need to make sure that you write to your employees uh, before those two dates to confirm whether they will continue or not, um, failing which um, you will um, face hefty penalties. Um, so just keeping on top of our, our required dates moving forward and making sure that we again document and write to our employees when we have to. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so just a, um, a few more questions coming through. So uh, if you're no longer eligible for JobKeeper, but you don't have sufficient work to keep all employees um, on the books, you know, what are what are your options there? Yeah, absolutely. So a number of options. Uh, the first one, as I said, consult with your employees. Uh, that's the biggest one at the moment. Before, before diving into redundancies, uh, talk to your employees, see what it is that they're willing to, to do. If there is an agreement to be reached as to reduction of hours um, or um, people to take annual leave for a period of time if they've got it, or particularly your long service leave employees, uh, if you have any, if they've accrued a significant amount of long service leave, we can direct them to take that on, on certain notice periods or we can ask them to take it and they can agree. Um, failing that uh, or failing any ability for us to direct them to take annual leave under uh, modern awards or, or our collective agreements, um, then it is unfortunately a redundancy process um, and we go through the redundancy process outlined, um, meet with them, explain or do the investigation, explain to them moving forward that we don't have the role, um, get their response and then ultimately declare their position redundant yeah. Uh, and they'll unfortunately be out of there, uh, but hopefully doesn't necessarily come to that um, for everyone. Yeah, okay. Uh, so a few more questions. Uh, what happens if an employee who is on JobKeeper resigns mid JobKeeper fortnight? Yeah, okay. Um, an employee who is on JobKeeper in a fortnight is entitled to receive that full JobKeeper fortnight payment. Okay. Um, so it, unfortunately, it, it's not a prorated amount. You must pay the full amount. Um, the, the ATO has been uh, back and forth a couple of times about what we can include in that JobKeeper payment. Um, it's something that absolutely should be discussed with, uh, with our accountants because um, certain payments are included, um, but some aren't. So originally the position was that uh, annual leave paid out um, and notice period and redundancy could be included. Um, that was then varied to limit it to just annual leave. Um, and so we need to, to check with our accountants, but um, they're entitled to the full amount. It's just a question of whether there is going to be a top up or not um, yeah. based on what we have to pay out at the end of their employment. Um, so check with our accountant what we can include in that final payment. Yeah. Um, also keep in mind, employees who resign from their employment are required to give us notice. Nice. Yeah. Um, if an employee resigns and doesn't give us notice, um, the modern awards provide for an ability to deduct one week from their outstanding entitlements. Uh, and also most, a lot of enterprise and collective agreements allow us to deduct significantly more. Um, mm -hmm. That would be useful in circumstances where uh, the annual leave accrual exceeds the JobKeeper payment um, because then we'll be limited to only paying the JobKeeper payment. But um, unfortunately there are times where employees resign mid JobKeeper fortnight Mm. They've got no, um, no annual leave in which we have to pay out. Um, they don't provide us notice and there's no redundancy pay to be paid, uh, but we still have to pay them because we have to ensure we comply with our JobKeeper payment requirements. Um, yeah. It's not worth getting in trouble for, for the sake of one employee uh, where we get that money back from the government. Yeah, understood. Okay, and uh, final 
question that we have on the line right now is, uh, and it, I guess it's a really, a really good one in terms of just at the basics. Um, if you have an employer, employee who is already registered for, or receiving JobKeeper, do they have to be re-registered for JobKeeper 2.0? No, they're, they're, they're already registered. Um, there's no need for you to do so. Um, the, the only time that we needed to reconsider that was in circumstances that um, when 1 July, or sorry, when the 3 August um, document or change of date came around, and that is 1 July was the eligible date, uh, yeah. there would have been further employees who uh, were in, entitled to it. Uh, but if they have already signed a JobKeeper enabling, uh, or sorry, JobKeeper um, eligibility form, uh, that form will continue moving forward. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, James. Oh, just sorry, one that has come through just now. Um, when do we change the payment of JobKeeper to our employees to the new $1,200 rate? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the first fortnight is going to be the fortnight commencing at the 28th of September. Okay. Uh, so that is going to be Monday, 28th September. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, James. Um, that's it for us for now. So, you know, listen, just, yeah, you know, one of the things that I always find interesting is that, you know, during this, this whole challenging time, we see a lot of headlines, you know, and certainly for JobKeeper, what I've seen is from this date, 1200 750 But I think where there's real, real value is understanding, you know, the details of how it happens and also what are the levers that are available for us as employers to give directions and how we can make it work for our business. And, and listen, you know, I think unashamedly, one of the things that we're, we're trying to do during this whole process is for our HRA members, EWPA members, TSHA members, is to give them information, uh, give them tools and, and give them the, the levers to be able to sort of navigate through this, this process and then you come out the other end. So um, as always, James, your information is invaluable. And if you're a member or as members of HRA, and EWPA and TSHA, I would encourage you very strongly to contact James, the team at MST, via the HRNet hotline. Um, if you have any questions around this, um, this webinar has been recorded, so this will be made available to you shortly as well. Keep an eye out for um, the postings on that. Um, and finally, you know, thank you for everyone that is, has attended. So not only James for presenting, but all of our members that have attended. We hope that you've gotten a lot out of this and we would really, really encourage you to continue to dial in for our future webinars as well. But on behalf of us at the National Office, thank you very much and we wish you well in the coming days. Thank you, thank you very much.